Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg UK. I'm Danny Berger in London. You're looking at a beautiful shot of the city this morning. Now this week, we're going to focus on bank earnings, financial stability, and our exclusive interview with the chief executive of Barclays. Now shares are higher this morning as the UK lenders fixed income revenue beat estimates. We spoke exclusively to the CEO earlier. It was a very nice set of results this morning that we were privileged to publish. Um, what I liked about the results, Francine, is not just the numbers, but the composition of it. And FIC was an important part, but not the only part. Um, so if you look at the numbers top line, uh, you know, 2.6 billion of profit before tax and sterling, it's about up 16%, revenues up around 11%, 7.2 billion pounds an excellent ROTE of 15% across the group, capital ending where we would like it to be, uh, one of the, you know, a record quarter of performance for the bank and yep. the second biggest for the corporate and investment bank. So all very good. Um, now, what drives it? And that's the important part. And for us, it's actually been the workings of many, many quarters of yep. building this. Mm -hmm. And there are two parts I'd like to highlight. The first is the investments which we've made in our business. Whether it's in our credit card portfolios in the U.S., mm -hmm. where we acquired a gap portfolio of 10 million customers, and whether it is in our markets business, mm -hmm. where not just investment in technology and people and fixed income, yeah. but also in our trading systems, but also in financing, both in fixed income and in equities prime, which continue to help us in this environment. So if you look at FIG trading, are you expecting this momentum to go into the second quarter? So we hope to keep the the market share that we have gained with our clients okay. over a number of years to persist. We've broadened and deepened relationships. The actual dollar amount of revenues, of course, goes up and down with volatility in the markets. And that's much, much harder to predict. But what we try to do is to have that capability. So is this a kind of diversification for, from the rest when you look at your, your main drivers going forward? Um, well, what we hope is that we have a lot of drivers Okay. and that at the right times in the market that they all are there Perfect. and they click. So, you know, the first quarter of this year was a lot about the bond markets. Interest rates went up and down with the stuff in banking that happened in the U.S. The first quarter a year ago was about equity vol, right. single stocks. Right. And, and then our equity business was ready to capture that. So that's how we try to do it, have a full-fledged capability. So when you look at market, which was pretty incredible, when yes. you look at the banks, starting with the SVB and then Credit Suisse, does that mean that you, you had deposits, that people come to you because they were afraid of other banks? So the UK has been more insulated from that deposit flight across banks um, than certainly the US has been between the regionals and the big money center banks. Having said that, our deposit franchise grew by about 10 billion pounds during okay. the quarter. Uh, and a lot of that was actually people, corporates, putting deposits with us. Um, on the consumer side, it dropped a little, but that seasonality we expect as okay. people pay their income tax okay. bills and draw money from their accounts to do that. So the deposit franchise has behaved extremely well yeah. and predictably. But it's also for us, it's a deposit franchise that we've built over decades. Right, with yeah. a very nice mixture of individuals, of corporates, uh, small businesses. The CEO of Barclays speaking exclusively to us earlier. Coming up, we're looking ahead to more UK bank, bank earnings next week, how they have fared this past quarter amid the global banking turmoil. We'll discuss all of that next. This is Bloomberg. Top line growth has been really strong for us, so we're up 13% on our top line growth. We were up double digits last year, so the overall performance of the business has been fantastic. The profitability is now up at the levels we last saw back in 2015, so a long period of time since. Interest rates going up has clearly been a help in that, but also we have seen a lot of client demand, as particularly the Asian markets now pull through the COVID period and start to look forwards. Does that mean that even if the Fed, the BOE, stops hiking, 
that interest income margins will have peaked or is this not the peak yet? So last year, our interest margin was about 1.4%. We have said this year we think it will be about one7 And we have said next year we think it will be about 1.75. Mm. So we, we are sort of nearing a higher level, but still on the rise. So if everything looks good, profitability is still strong. Your figure of $5 billion mm. worth of capital returns by 2024, would you say that's a conservative figure then? <laughs> um, well, we, we need to start somewhere. So um, five billion, <coughs> we are roughly halfway through. Um, in, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of what we have announced so far, um, five billion coincidentally will be the amount that back in 2015 we raised as a rights issue. So essentially, it will be handing that money back. Um, but I'd say overall, we're well on track for delivering the five billion. Mm -hmm. Are you still fearful that the worst of the contagion, again, emanating from a market far away from yours, but are, are you fearful that perhaps that's not over yet? There obviously have been two major issues in the sector. But actually for us as a business, we have actually seen our numbers stay <coughs> incredibly solid. So our deposits have remained very, very stable throughout the period. So not that anybody is totally insulated from something going on in the sector, but I do think the fact our businesses are more based in other parts of the world. We are very spread. Our deposits are spread across many countries, many different types of client. I think actually our business model is a very robust business model for this sort of circumstance. Well, almost, I mean, perversely, does it help you? And I'm thinking here specifically uh, of Credit Suisse. Did you see flow that was clearly from them, clearly from their clients, especially in wealth management, fleeing Credit Suisse and, and coming into Standard Charter? I think if you look back over the last probably six months or so, particularly the last part of last year, we saw strong growth in, in, in our assets under management. I think some of that was probably helped by some shift away from um, some banks like that. Um, so I think this will be a flight to safety. I think the bigger, more robust um, institutions that have been around a long time are trusted will be the beneficiaries of this. In January, first Abu Dhabi Bank said it had explored to de uh, a deal with Standard Charter to buy it. Um, since February, it said it's no longer planning to, deal, to do so. Um, have you had any conversations with them since? Is Standard Charter, is the future still an independent bank? We have had no discussion with them whatsoever. We are an independent bank. We are motoring well under our own devices. We're very pleased with our performance. Standard Chartered CFO Andy Halford speaking to me there after releasing its earnings yesterday. Now, Standard Charter and Barclays are just two of the biggest London-based banks that have reported earnings this week. Investors at this point are seeking more clarity on the health of the global economy. And if there are any signs of fallout from the turmoil in the banking sector, and of course we can't forget the Brexit impact either. Bloomberg recently revealed that Paris has been a, seen a surge rather in top paying bank jobs. So we have a lot to cover here. Joining me now to do so is our city editor, Catherine Griffiths and William Shaw from the Bloomberg's finance team. Thank you both so much for joining today. Uh, well, let me start with you just when it comes from what we've heard from the banking sector so far, specifically in the UK. Barclays Standard Charter just heard from both of them. What have been your big takeaways? So like you were saying, this is the first real indication of what um, negative effects banks might have experienced from S. VB and Credit Suisse going down last month. Um, the immediate answer seems to be everything is looking pretty good. So um, if you look at Barclays, their their fit traders have beat estimates. Um, their fixed income traders have seen revenue up 9% to 1.79 billion pounds in the first quarter. Now that's actually compared to analyst estimates of a drop of 11%. So that comes against the backdrop effectively of high, in, high interest rates which are creating volatility in the market and creating opportunities for traders to bet on what rates and what inflation are going to do next. Um, Standard Chartered as well has had very positive results. So yesterday we saw they'd had their, their best quarter since the first quarter of 2014. Mm. Uh, again, that's partly a function of interest rates and partly it's about economies in Asia accelerating their exit out of COVID-related lockdowns. We've got NatWest, HSBC and Lloyds now to watch for further indications. One of the things at, at Barclays that, that came on strong were its deposits. It's on increase um, when the fear at the moment for many banks is deposit flights. I just want to quickly play for both of you the comments from the CEO and get your thoughts. Take a listen. The UK has been more insulated from that deposit flight across banks. 
um, than certainly the U.S. has been between the regionals and the big money center banks. Having said that, our deposit franchise grew by about 10 billion pounds during the quarter. Uh, and a lot of that was actually people, corporates, putting deposits with us. So, well, I'm going to start with you again here. Why has the UK been more insulated? So there's a couple of reasons for that. I mean, first of all, if you look at what happened to SVB, so um, smaller banks like SVB in the US were, they received a carve out from stress testing requirements, um, which meant no one ever got an indication of what would happen to a firm like SVP um, when borrowing costs rose sharply. Um, the UK never provided that kind of carve out and therefore they haven't faced the drama that, that banks in the US have. Mm. Um, regulators point to um, Virgin Money, which is an equivalent style, uh, equivalent sized bank to SVB in the UK, and there are no obvious problems um, with Virgin, with Virgin mm. Money. Uh, Catherine, does that mean regulators are, are off the hook if we're not having that deposit flight like is occurring in the US? I think, I think they wouldn't want to say this definitely publicly, but I think privately they do slightly feel quite pleased with how things have gone in the UK as we saw the dramatic difference in SVB in the US and SVB here in the UK which was sold to HSBC over a single weekend they would say about that that it was possible to sell the UK business because it was in far better shape than some of those US regional lenders and they would trace that back to things like making sure that the UK part was subsidiarised, so it was entirely regulated here in the UK from last year, and that made it in a much better position to enact the sale. Well, Andrew Bailey did raise the prospect of increasing the level for um, UK deposit insurance to 85,000. Jeremy Hunt, if I'm not mistaken, followed up with, with a similar comment, coincidentally or not, at, at, at very similar times. What is the likelihood of that happening? I think it's really quite likely that they will raise the, the level, the £85,000 here in the UK. It's lower than in the US where it's $250,000, for example. But the question, of course, is to what point will they raise it? Um, there's been talk about whether we could potentially guarantee all deposits in the system. It just wouldn't work in a, in a country like the UK where financial services and deposits are such a big part of the economy. It might threaten our credit rating as a country, potentially. So they've got to find other ways to inject more confidence into the system. So we'll definitely see, I think we'll definitely see, the limit being raised, mm. but we'll see other measures being taken to try to make sure that when there's the next problem, as there inevitably will be, and of course it won't look the same as SVB, it will look different in some way, that people don't immediately rush to take their money out because that's the huge challenge we now face in this internet age. SVB in the US, people took out the amount of deposits that you might ordinarily think in a problem time in a month. They took them out in a matter of hours. Right. You can never kind of deal with that apart from on the other side of things, which is about confidence and making sure systems work, work well. And I guess now you can also tweet about it. You can make a TikTok that you're getting your money out. So that sort of word travels so much more quickly. Um, Will, how would big banks feel if they had to put more into a deposit insurance fund? Would they be upset with, with regulation like that? Well, so John Vickers, who's one of the architects of UK financial regulation, has told um, Bloomberg that these changes to deposit guarantees would require higher capital charges on banks. Obviously, banks don't like their capital charges. It limits the amount of money they've got to invest elsewhere. It's likely something that would cause a lot of consternation in the banking sector. So there would probably be a discussion, you know, what, what's more important for us here to make sure that we're protecting retail consumers or to appease, appease the lenders on the amounts of capital reserves that they, that they need to hold and making sure that they're not being prohibited from doing business unreasonably. Mm. So we're going to, in just a bit, talk with our tech reporter about the UK CMA turning down or blocking the deal between Microsoft and Activision. So I don't want to get into the details too much. But, Catherine, there has been this ongoing fight of whether London can reign supreme in terms of a financial centre, whether companies want to list here or list in the US. Is there some element of, of discouraging if you see the UK financial authorities blocking a very large deal? Well... That's certainly what the folks were saying yesterday, that it was terrible and it clearly London didn't want growth. And it seemed a very partisan and quite emotional statement, in, in my view mm. at least. Um, of course, all these things feed into people's decisions about where they're going to list. And 
Yesterday, there were several senior city people who gave evidence to Parliament about this issue. And what they said time and time again is you have to have different things that are changed in order to improve the whole ecosystem. So it really can't just be about straightforwardly folks get paid more money in the US or there's a higher valuation on the stock. Those, those come from other factors. So there's a higher valuation on the stock because there's more liquidity in the US. We need to bring that liquidity into the UK market. One of the things that comes across time and time again is how you, how you harness the huge, huge pensions industry we have here into being more effective investors in UK companies. If I'm not mistaken, you both wrote a piece on this. Is that right? Okay, we, we have did. the perfect, perfect two people to, to talk about that. Well, what will it take um, to get what the folks you and Catherine spoke with about getting that money into London? What does it, what does it take in terms of regulation or, or investment? I was struck yesterday a bit by the fact that uh, these three sort of senior city figures speaking in Parliament seem to be much better at identifying and analysing the problem than, than suggesting like any, any obvious solution. Mm. I mean, in order to make a change like this, you need Parliament to give new powers to, to the Financial Conduct Authority um, in, order, in order to assist with that. Okay. So ju just to wrap things up, and, and Catherine, I feel like this is an impossible question, but you touched on this a bit. What are sort of the next crises that regulators have their eyes on? What is it the next thing that they're thinking about tackling, or is it just taking care of the problems we've seen over the past month? Yeah, that is an impossible <laughs> yes. question. And as everyone always says, I'd be a hedge fund manager if I knew the answer. I think, I mean, there are certain sort of, you know, flashing lights in the economy which are easier to identify. So some of the US banks talked about commercial real estate being potentially mm. quite a problem. Um, the US debt ceiling is obviously causing huge drama across the world. But really that more sort of philosophical point about what's the nature of the next crisis is very difficult. I don't think anyone really would have identified the SVB crisis mm. particularly, although as we started this discussion, uh, UK regulators did, in fact, see the sort of concentration risk and some of those issues around this particular group of customers. But I do think this, this new world of instantaneous withdrawals of deposits creates a real problem across the board. So whatever the actual pressure point turns out to be, it's this point about if we want a world where we have fractional banking, where you believe in people being able to put their money into banks and take it out whenever they like, you've got to deal with the fact that people can do that in an instant now. And that's a very new thing. It's so true. Hey, Catherine, well, thank you both so much for joining this morning. Really fascinating conversation. That's Catherine Griffiths, our city editor, and William Shaw from Bloomberg's finance team. And be sure to describe to Bloomberg's In the City podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes drop every Thursday. Coming up, is the game over? The UK puts Microsoft's $69 billion takeover of Activision Blizzard in jeopardy after blocking the deal. We'll discuss that, that next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg UK. I'm Danny Berger in London. UK regulators have blocked Microsoft's $69 billion purchase of Activision Blizzard over concerns it would harm cloud gaming competition. The company's plan to appeal the decision as they try to salvage the biggest ever deal in gaming. With us now is Bloomberg's Alex Webb. Um, Alex, what exactly are they worried about? So it, it's not necessarily games on the consoles themselves, but it's it's the cloud. What are their thoughts there? So yeah, cloud is a Console gaming is very much the model we're used to over the past 20, 30, 40 years where, yeah, you sell a game, play it on a console, boom, off mm. to the races. The new model that is really evolving is cloud gaming, often subscription-based, where you might pay clearly a certain amount every month and you get through that access to a whole bunch of different games. It's something that Microsoft has been quite bullish about. It's sort of a medium to long-term play built on Azure on their cloud. I suspect, therefore, that what's happening with regulators is they are trying to ensure they avoid the mistakes of the past. When Facebook bought WhatsApp, when Facebook bought Instagram, they weren't necessarily massive competitors to Facebook. But in hindsight, regulators suspect maybe they could have become 
competitors, similar with Google and DoubleClick. So what they're doing is making a decision early mm. in, the, in this race to try to prevent market concentration. But, but why, why is this a fear? I mean, can't Microsoft just say, all right, it won't just be available for down, to download on our cloud store. Other gamer, gaming companies can do this too. Why, why, why are regulators picking on this? So one of the concessions that Microsoft offered was to make it available for a certain number of years, make things like Call of Duty, which is made by Activision Blizzard, available for a certain number of years to its competitors in the cloud. The challenge with that is what happens after a certain mm. number of years, often sort of five years, goes quicker than people will imagine. And secondly, uh, it's something that the regulator will need to keep an eye on, right? It requires further regulation, which is a bit of a burden they don't necessarily want to take on. So what next? Can they successfully appeal this? Well, they can appeal. Whether they can successfully appeal is uh, the big question. It, there's not a great track record of, of companies appealing CMA decisions. The other thing, of course, is we're yet to hear from US or European regulators. There's a possibility they, they might take a similar tack, in which case it would render perhaps an appeal in Europe so in the UK, sort of moot if the decision mm. across the board is to block this. Yeah, I, uh, Chris, Chris Hughes have, has a really good opinion piece where he says something like, you know, Think again if you want to do m and in, in Britain. So uh, it's interesting to think also about the chilling effect perhaps on, on m and in this country as well and regulation there. Alex, thank you so much for joining us. That is Bloomberg's Alex Webb. Now, later today on the European Close, we're going to be hearing from the CEO of Activision Blizzard. That's Bobby Kotick. That's going to be at 4 p.m. UK time, 11 a.m. New York. Well, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour with Matt Miller and Anna Edwards. This is Bloomberg.